Good evening, everybody. It's uh, an honor and pleasure for me to introduce the Committee for Study of Stillbirths in IHCP, which is part of the Stillbirth Society of India. And as we all know that every month we have been focusing on one important cause of stillbirth. And after a lot of people asking for this one, the IHCP Unsolved Enigma to be solved. But before we go ahead with the session, I'll start by introducing the committee members. So I'm really proud and privileged that Professor Ashla Batra consented to be the chair for this committee. We all know her as working in one of the busiest hospitals, Savdarjang Hospital at Delhi. She is past president of AOGD, President Narchi, advisor Eurogynecology Committee, Foxy, chairperson of our own society here, resource person for Ministry of Health guidelines, WHO fellow MCH, review of national journals, and everywhere we pick up a book of guidelines, we see her name there, authored numerous articles in national and international journals, co-investigator in LSTM project, co-investigator Indo-US project, co-investigator ICMR projects, uh, important project on iron sucrose, WHO saver project, she's a master trainer, and of course, most important, the national emergency. She's part of the IUCD Ministry of Health, AOGD Foxy projects, and also on abortion care. She's a trainer of Government of India, WHI Foxy IPAS, as well as trainer, uh, Reproductive and Child Healthcare, AOFG 1995. It's my uh, privilege to introduce Dr. Ranjana Sharma. She's a senior consultant, Obzengaini, urogynecology, laparoscopic surgery, and robotic surgery at Apollo Hospitals, Apollo Cradle Royal Delhi. She's chairperson of All India Coordinating Committee of RCOG, North Zone, North Zone Coordinator of Oncology Committee of Foxy. She's an MRCOG examiner and reviewer of the prestigious Green Top Guidelines, executive committee member uh, of various associations and past governing council member of Indian Menopause Society. Also the chairperson of Eurogynecology Committee and chairperson of IMS Delhi chapter. We also have on board Dr. Harsha Gaikwad, professor again at Savdarjang Hospital, New Delhi. And she's done a lot of work in this field, WHO Daily Stillbirth Registry Project Coordinator, member Stillbirth Society of India. And we all know uh, that she has published uh, in various national and international journals. Uh, Dr. Faria is also on board. She's working at Iran Medical College as an associate professor with special interest in high-risk pregnancy, infertility, and gynecological laparoscopy. And she's life member of various associations as well as part of this committee. So now I hand over uh, uh, the proceedings to Dr. Ashla Batra, the committee chair. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, uh, uh, people. I think uh, I, I felt very privileged when you asked me to chair uh, the ISCP because I have really been interested in the liver disorders in pregnancy. The so I I before I give what uh, you know what is my vision for the committee. I thought ki I will just give a short overview of what we are going to deal with today. We all know IACP, like I said, is an enigma. We still have come a long way from where we started in 1853 when it was first described as, you know, uh, just as pruritis of pregnancy by Elfid. And uh, then it was thought it was a benign disorder, you know, it just causes pruritis. And then after 1950, a lot of interest was generated in ISCP, but still it was thought as a benign disorder. But later on, uh, with uh, and it was called you know various names recurrent uh, uh, pruritus of pregnancy or uh, cholestasis gestosis but when it was realized that it is affecting the perinatal health then a lot of research started on it and new and new uh, things are coming up about its pathogenesis and uh, the risk factors and how it should be managed but still you know there are many societies all over the world who are giving guidelines, but there is consensus on something. There is consensus on other things is not there because ISCP is affected by ethnicity. 
so uh, we can't have you know universal guidelines when something which is uh, now even thought to be genetic so it has to be different uh, you know in different uh, places so we all know what ihcp is pruritus abnormal liver function abnormal bile acid no, nothing has to be told and prevalence i like i said it is different in different part of the words and uh, in india we have found the prevalence you know various studies which have done some have found the prevalence of 1% 2% but most of them have found uh, more than the reported prevalence of 1.2 mostly between 3 to 4% but uh, etiology again estrogen or uh, gene mutation but what even estrogen or gene mutation what they are doing is they are affecting the hepatobiliary transport of the proteins and uh, environmental factor also play a role because seem to be more common during winter season selenium deficiency vitamin d deficiency has been reported the personal history is the biggest risk factor with a recurrence rate of 40 to 90% then people who have cholelithiasis or hepatitis c chronic hepatitis multifetal pregnancy they multifetal pregnancy because the estrogen levels are more and the etiology is estrogen dependent and uh, we all know that fetal complications can be there because of uh, iscp uh, it can be sudden stillbirth preterm labor meconium staining low birth weight respiratory distress so syndrome and the odd ratio for it has been studied in many meta analysis that it can cause and maternal complication not so severe severe pruritus and some effect on postpartum bleeding but uh, not much has been proved because hardly ever pt gets deranged in iscp and it has also been associated with long term complications uh, people who have uh, iscp because of genetic predisposition they have higher incidence of hepatobiliary disorders cirrhosis and even the children of iscp mothers have been found to have high body mass index and dyslipidemia at the age of 16 so it is a disease which can cause long term outcome also and uh, it is confusing because you can have uh, liver function deranged along with you know just the pruritus of pregnancy and you will think it is iscp or you can have just pruritus and uh, because uh, it is not always that the enzyme levels or bile acid would rise first pruritus occurs and you will just leave it as pruritus so increased bile acids uh, due to various causes like help fatty liver or dermatological condition can be confused with uh, iscp again management is also very difficult because we have different criteria for managing different uh, methods uh, you know frequencies of fetal surveillance different delivery timings by various uh, guidelines so the uh, management is really challenging and then uh, diagnosis of course uh, we have said to write this with Uh, increase in the bile acid than lft but then uh, it is not always possible to do bile acid so we are mostly diagnosing with bile acid and uh, liver functions especially alt even rcog in the uh, latest guideline recognizes that it is not mandatory for diagnosis but for prognosis bile acids are very important because the liver function as yet have not been proved to be you know uh, uh, a prognostic but the bile acid level have been found to be prognostic uh, cate the disease and the various societies have again you know uh, taken various cut offs but 40 i would say 40 micromole is the cut off which should keep in mind though rcog says that up to 100 no stillbirth will occur but they also agree that between 40 to 100 mill micromole there would be higher incidence of uh, meconium staining and we don't even want that so these are the australian guidelines and we have uh, rcog who's the latest guidelines they say that you should take uh, lft and bile acid uh, fortnightly till 36 weeks and then you do it uh, depending upon the bile acid levels if there are more than 40 then you do it bi weekly if it is less than 40 you continue weekly i don't know how feasible is that 
being so expensive, taking three days for the results to come. But this is what the guidelines say. And drugs, of course, like erythromycin, augmentin, and uh, flu oxycillin should be avoided because they also cause cholestasis. The other thing we must remember is when what we give for, uh, uh, you know, for pruritus, the or so disoxycholic acid. If a patient is taking or so toxicolic acid, her bile acid level may increase because the serum bile acid level, 60% of those would be because of the treatment you are taking. So that has to be taken with a pinch of salt. And uh, up to now, the guidelines say just because of uh, rise in ALT, because you should not be inducing early because uh, there is no increased uh, risk of stillbirth or association with the poor and perinatal outcome with just the liver function test. And everybody is, uh, you know, very sure all the guidelines which we have from outside India that the bile acid have to be taken for prognostication. Monitoring has been advocated, we can do CTG, you can do ultrasound, you can do kick count, but nothing correlates. If a stillbirth has to occur, it will occur suddenly because it is not something which is going on chronically. It is, you know, uh, arrhythmia because of the effect on the heart muscles or it is a sudden uh, spasm in the vessel which causes stillbirth. So you can't really predict if the stillbirth will occur by fetal monitoring, but still it's a good idea to do fetal monitoring because if due to some other reason also there is a fetal compromise, then ISCP will add on to it. So you can remember that point. Delivery again, again a very, very controversial points, 37 weeks, 38 weeks, 37 to 38 weeks, mm -hmm. and then based on the level of the bile acids. Now here we are, you know, concerned if we are terminating all pregnancies with ISCP diagnosed at whatever level at 37 weeks, we would be doing a lot of induction. And when we do induction, we know the uh, cesarean rate increases and do all women of ISCP require induction at 37 weeks, which is what we are doing, or do we need to have, you know, certain cutoff levels of our own. Uh, of course, bile acids have been given but are we able to do bile acid for everyone? So that is something we will discuss in our vision. Vitamin K, uh, everybody is giving routinely, but uh, the evidence says if the PT is not prolonged, then uh, there is no increase in the blood loss. Here again, there's not always a possibility in our settings at places where you can do PT. So there is no harm in giving vitamin K if you are not able to do PT. Drugs for pruritus, emollient, steroid, uh, uh, also disoxycholic acid have been used. Then there has been this uh, trial which said that uh, if you give this also disoxycholic acid, the levels of the uh, transaminases fall. And uh, but there is no effect on the perinatal outcome. You know, itching may decrease. The levels may fall two weeks after treatment. But perinatal outcome is not, so we should remember that perinatal outcome is not going to be affected by your treating with urso disoxycholic acid. And uh, this latest trial, which has uh, come, you know, in 2019, they even say that uh, it has no effect on stillbirth also, uh, just the itch score and the transaminases decrease and the biases also do not increase. This is the phase three trial, which has uh, just been uh, uh, out. And newer drugs, because pruritus is something which a woman is rarely troubled with. You see them, they, you know, they can't sleep. And sometimes uh, even this or so this oxycholic acid doesn't help. So newer drugs, depending upon the new research, which has, uh, uh, which tells us, you know, how the bile transport system is affected, which causes accumulation of bile acids. So to counteract that uh, accumulation to, uh, you know, uh, we have heparin, rifampicin, adenosyl, methionine, they are being investigated. They have been found to be useful along with also disoxycholic acid, but stand alone still, uh, there is the, not been proved that they alone can help. So what we want to do, so now we have this data which says that uh, bile acids can prognosticate, but can we do bile acids? And uh, 
they have given us a level of 40 for meconium and 100 for stillbirth, but is it okay for us to be having that high level? We hardly see that level. And I think in the study by Dr. Gujral, they had two stillbirth and both of them had a level of 42 and 48, something like that. So we can't just follow what the West is giving us that follow this. We have to have our own data. We have to define our own cutoffs. We have to have our own timing of delivery. So probably if we make a registry with a short, simple form, you know, we, everybody just collects data and see what is happening. We can't do a RCT like, you know, uh, at this bile acid we do induction at, at this level we don't do because that wouldn't be ethical nobody will allow it but at least we can collect our data you know because we do get patients who come to us at 38 weeks 39 weeks so if possible do a bile acid if not possible at least do the ALT because uh, Dr. Anjali also has a paper, she's with us, in which they have, you know, taken a cutoff of, I think, 133 for the ALT levels, after which they found that the fetal uh, perinatal uh, outcome was poorer. So the need of the R is to have our own data, to have our own cutoffs, and for that, we all have to unite, you know. I found numerous studies from India, but uh, no study had bile acid. So we have to do a study with bile acid together along with the, the transaminases to you know, find the correlation and give some guidelines to our uh, country. You know, This is what I think uh, we should do and I think it can be done. We have a lot of people who are working in public sector so they can collect a lot of data. So let us see what we can do, but we can always begin. To... Thank you. Thank you, Tamkin, for giving us the chance to be, uh, you know, the part of this. Now I hand over to Dr. Akriti to take the proceeding forward, unless somebody has to make some comment. I will say, Dr. Achila, this is a very good idea because we are doing routinely bile acids, you know. So we are doing bile acids and transaminases also. So you give us the form, but let's do a collective study that will help us, you know. Yeah, yes. in private, you can do it yeah. in government. Uh, I think Anjali, Anjali, are you there? Dr. Anjali is there? So I think it's a collective yeah. data, but in one but year, we will have to probably it. can get an ICMR project yeah. for Subjang Hospital where we can, you know, do in a large scale and join with the, all the private hospitals yeah. who have the possibility of doing it. No, no, we will do it. I think that's a very good idea, Dr. Dr. Batra, and I think we're all we can all be there in it with you. Yeah. Yeah. So there is going to be a study. Yeah, that's what I thought that uh, Dr. Anjali had something in pipeline. So that uh, maybe after that study we'll be wiser. Yeah, Dr. Anjali, you are muted. Uh, because in our it. hospitals, when we do it, we get the results of bile acid by next day. You know, there are many labs which are giving us good labs the next day. And it really helps us. So now I hand over to our MRC to take the proceeding further. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Akriti Batra, and I have the privilege to be the master of ceremony uh, for this prestigious webinar on IHCP and Enigma. To begin with, I invite Dr. Harsha Gwalkar. I invite her to present her data on liver disease as a causative factor in stillbirth from Sapujam Hospital. Good evening, respected seniors and dear friends. Thank you, Akriti. And uh, I think the introductory part by Dr. Ashla Batra was, was uh, more than sufficient. And uh, I remember when she was uh, our faculty at Sapujam <sighs> Hospital, any patient who had some problem with uh, some liver disorder, we used to uh, simply rush or simply seek her advice on the management of that patient with liver disorder. So Dr. Achla Batra's name was synonymous with a uh, uh, specialist in uh, liver disorders. And something like this coming from her is really will add to the knowledge that we are already having. And she has highlighted some very important points in her talk. So, uh, so I am presenting uh, this presentation of liver disorders as maternal factor in the causation of stillbirth. 
As we know, intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is unique uh, dermatosis characterized by onset of itching during the second and third trimester without any uh, primary skin lesions, and it is generally associated with raised bile acids and transaminases. Maternal prognosis is generally good, but may have adverse fetal outcome like meconium staining, uh, fetal bradycardia, and fetal loss. The incidence, as already was pointed out by Ashla ma'am, very, is varying from 0.02% to 15 to somewhere 22%. Mm -hmm. The average A, uh, yes, yes. is at 31 weeks. The predisposing factors, just to summarize, being genetic, environmental, hormonal, and there is a genetic mutation of MDR3 gene encoding, canalicular phosphatidylcholine. The molecular mechanism in relation to estrogen is still not clear. Uh, however, vitamin D deficiency and selenium deficiency may be implicated in its causation, and uh, the research is ongoing on this topic. The fetal complications may be prematurity, fetal hypoxia, and fetal death. Sometimes the cause is simply unknown. Cause may be uh, accumulation of toxic metabolites in the placental vessels, which leads to vasoconstriction, or there may be fetal arrhythmias leading to sudden death because of increased cardiac muscle sensitivity to oxytocin, which is uh, mostly the mainstay in this uh, particular condition uh, in its pathophysiology. So pregnancy-related liver disorders account for 3 to 4% in our setting. The commonly encountered liver disorders were ISCP, health, AFLP, infective hepatitis and jaundice due to unrelated conditions like drug-induced hemolysis, pre-existing liver conditions. These liver disorders can lead to adverse uh, maternal and fetal outcomes. So we conducted a study and during the study period of three years from 2018 to 2021, there were a total of 75,277 at Sardinian Hospital. The number of stillbirths occurred was 2,309 among the total deliveries, bringing the rate to 30 per 1,000 births. And among the various maternal and fetal cause of stillbirths, those were studied, there were exclusively two cases associated with maternal liver disorders, making it 4.4%, which is concurrent to the current literature in the development or incidence of ISCP with pregnancy. But this was particularly focused on the stillbirths, association of ISCP with the stillbirths. The disorders related to pregnancy were mostly ISCP, health, and AFLP in that order of occurrence. And the disorders unrelated to pregnancy were hepatitis A, E, C, and others. So in this graph, it is seen that ISCP was the leading cause associated with stillbirth, that is 49.02%, followed by hepatitis E, jaundice due to other causes, health syndrome, hepatitis A, and lastly, AFLP, in order of frequency. The second graph showed, we studied the epidemiological profile of mothers with liver disorders having a stillbirth, and we found that most of the mothers in all the groups were unbooked, and uh, the other categories were either registered or referred. Booked cases were very few, and it was also a significant factor. Mostly the cases belong to the rural areas, and uh, the patients with uh, AFLP, all the patients with AFLP were from the rural background. Majority of the hepatitis A were primary gravida, and uh, all the cases with clinical diagnosis of AFLP were multigravita, and uh, these women also gave history of uh, liver disorders in previous pregnancy. So this chart uh, is a continuation of the previous one. The average age of presentation was of uh, mothers was 25.8 to 29.7 uh, years in all the groups. However, patients with uh, HELP syndrome uh, the age was slightly higher. Uh, that means health syndrome occurred in more of the uh, elderly gravitas. The ANC visits were three, uh, on an average, there were only three ANC visits in all the uh, uh, groups. However, the last ANC visit was mostly in the third trimester. Uh, and it was 32 to 36 weeks uh, in uh, all the groups. 
average age of uh, gestation in these group was 32.3 to 37 percent and AFLP presented at 36 to 36.5 with a wide uh, narrow range health presented between 32 to 37 weeks, hepatitis A, 35 to 37 weeks, hepatitis E and uh, was uh, presented a bit earlier at 30.5 to 38.75 weeks and ISCP uh, about 33 weeks to 38.75 weeks. And the jaundice due to other causes presented uh, on the same uh, weeks, 32.2 to 37 weeks period of gestation. In this, we studied the association of a clinical presentation with uh, the final diagnosis or the groups. So uh, if we found that history of itching was predominantly present in the ISCP group in 78% of cases, and it was a significant factor. The other symptoms, uh, those were present, uh, the mothers presented with the pain in abdomen, vomiting, headache, presence of uh, jaundice, family history of jaundice, and loss of sleeping jaundice. Out of these three, we found that vomiting and the jaundice and family history were significant factors. Vomiting was present in 100% cases of AFLP and was followed by jaundice due to other causes. Jaundice as a sign was also studied and it was found in uh, most of the patients, majorly in the AFLP and the hepatitis E group. Also, and also in these two groups, there was a family history of uh, jaundice, which, which was also significant. However, loss of fetal movement was seen in 98% of cases of in ISCP. And uh, in most cases, the loss of uh, fetal movement was recorded for at least one day uh, uh, before coming to the hospital. And then the associated conditions were also studied and we found that the association of uh, fetal growth restriction and GDM and these two were highly significant uh, parameters and association of FGR and GDM with ISCP was found in 24% and 18% respectively and this was a highly significant factor. Although other conditions were also associated like hypertension, hypothyroidism, PRO and fever oligo. Then we assess the coagulation profile and liver function test parameters with the final diagnosis. And we found that uh, majorly the deranged coagulation was, uh, profile was found in the cases with uh, AFLP, I mean clinical AFLP and the uh, uh, HELP syndrome. In ISCP, only four cases had deranged coagulation profile. And there was the raised serum bilirubin in AFLP and hepatitis E. And it was also significant. The p-value was less than 0 0.001. And uh, the range of SGOT in ISCP was not much high and it was about 45 to 179, the SGOT. And the SGPT was 45 to 277. But we can see uh, the uh, range of SGPT and uh, SGOT and SGPT to be very high in the, the other conditions other than ISCP. Then we, also, then we studied the uh, stillbirth characteristics with the final diagnosis and we found that only 9 or 18 percent in the ISCP uh, group took the uh, usodeoxycholic uh, uh, treatment and the average duration of uh, receiving this treatment in most of the women, although other conditioned women was, were also taking probably because there was an overlap or presence of itching in all the other groups uh, also. And one can see the, the majority of the patients with all, in all the groups, they delivered, uh, they had a normal vaginal delivery, either spontaneous or induced. And uh, macerated stillbirth dominated the type of stillbirth. And we tried to find out the odds ratio in the non-ICP and the ISCP group, but we could not find a positive correlation. In conclusion, ISCP was the most common liver disorder characterized by the presentation of itching uh, with delayed electric effects from birth. None of the cases with isolated ISCP were found to have a deranged coagulation profile in our study. 
and cases having HTP and ISCP overlap. There were four such cases, and they had presented with abruptus presenting, and they had uh, varying degrees of coagulation. Unbooked status was also a highly significant factor. Very few presented in the early trimesters. In ISCP, the cases presented between 33.5 to 38.7 weeks, which was similar to other conditions. The average duration of itching was two months in the ISCP group. However, the risk of stillbirth was 24% if it was associated with FGR and 18% if it was associated with GDM in cases of ISCP. Hypothyroidism was incompetent in 14%. Anemia and hypertensive disorders were found in 10% each, and only nine cases in the ISCP group took oxycholic acid, and the P was highly significant. There was a loss of fetal movements, which ranged from one to three days in the ISCP group. So take-home message from this small study was, an unbooked patient presenting with ISCP in the third trimester will have increased of still birth if associated with Increasing severity of itching over body, loss of fetal movements, FGR, GDM, hypothyroidism and anemia, and not taking also the oxycholic acid. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the very informative presentation. Uh, we now move forward to the most awaited panel on uh, IHCP. Uh, so this panel on IHCP is being moderated by uh, Professor Jyotsna Suri, ma'am. She is the in charge of critical care unit of uh, VMMC and Subdivision Hospital uh, with keen interest in high risk obst obstetrics. And she has many accolades to her name. Uh, in the panelist galaxy, we have all stalwarts with personal experience in IHCP management. Firstly, uh, I would like to introduce Professor uh, Dr. Kan Kanwal Gujral. She's a chairperson OBS and gynae of Sir Gangaram Hospital and in charge of high risk pregnancy clinic. And she has done a lot of research in IHCP. Professor Anjali Debral, she's the HOD of VMMC, uh, OBS and Gynae, VMMC and Saptajan Hospital, and she is a keen academician, and she has done her personal research in IHCP. Uh, Dr. Anila, uh, uh, Dr. Angela, she's the director uh, and head minimal access surgery, Fortis Memorial Institute, Gurgaon, director OBS and Gynae at Fortis Lafem. And uh, she has a keen interest in maternal and fetal medicine and high-risk OBS. Dr. Seema Thakur, she is a senior consultant in genetics and fetal medicine at Fortis Hospital, Shalimar Bagh, Rainbow Children Hospital, Delhi, and the genetic clinic, Dwarka. She's also the chairperson of Delhi Society of Fetal Medicine and Genetics. Uh, Professor Sumitra Bachani, ma'am, she is a maternal and fetal medicine specialist at uh, VMMC and Subdivision Hospital, and also she is a secretary of fetal medicine Delhi branch. And last but not the least, Dr. Krati Mehrotra Devan. She uh, was a senior research associate, VMMC and Subdivision Hospital. And now she's working as a dermato oncologist at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, New Delhi. To give expert comments, we have Dr. Ranjana Sharma. She's the chairperson, All India Coordinating Committee of RCOG North Zone. And she's also a reviewer of Green Top Guidelines. She will be joined by Dr. Achla Batra to give her expert comments. Now I hand over to Professor uh, Jyotsna Suri, ma'am, to take over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Akriti. So at the outset, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Achla Batra uh, for giving us this opportunity uh, to do this panel. Very, very important topic. IHCP is a condition in which, as we have already learned, it is a condition uh, which is a very common pregnancy-specific liver disorder, the, rather the commonest one which we see. And it is associated with pruritus. And pruritus per se is a very common condition in pregnancy, affecting almost one-fourth of all pregnancies. The incidence of IHCP 
has been given as 0.3 to 0.5 percent, but Madam has already said in India it may be as high as uh, two to four percent, and uh, it has of course got lot of perinatal uh, <laughs> outcome. Very important issues are there as far as the perinatal outcome is uh, concerned, and we'll be discussing that shortly. And it is associated with many risk factors. So one of them being, you know, pre-existing hepatobiliary diseases, including HCV, cirrhosis, and gallstones. Then there could also be prior personal or family history with ICP, advanced maternal age, multiple gestation, and winter season has also been associated along with deficiencies of vitamin D and selenium. So these are all in the literature, you know, what are the risk factors for developing ICP. So now, uh, basically, we are going to discuss two cases. Uh, through the first case, we will be discussing the uh, diagnosis and differential diagnosis of uh, ICP. And through the second case, we will be discussing the management. So this, uh, both these cases are cases which were managed in Sabdajang Hospital in the last two to three months. So the first case is a 31-year-old primary gravida who came at 31 plus three weeks. She was referred to us with uncontrolled uh, GDM. She was on uh, the OHA and also with ICP. Uh, she was already on Udilif 300 milligram BD uh, and she was admitted in, in our ward. Uh, uh, with this diagnosis. So the patient was referred from private hospital, as I already told, in view of the uncontrolled sugar and ICP. And she gave history of pruritus developing from the sixth month of pregnancy, more over her palms and soles. So patient had already been started on TAB UDCA 300 milligram BD when she reported to us. So these were the, uh, on the examination, you know, these were the excoriation marks which were seen on the arms and legs of the patient we could not see any definite lesion so when we uh, you know uh, these are the investigations when the patient came to us and through the one month that we were following her so as you can see that the most important thing i have highlighted the lft so the serum bilirubin the ast alt and the alp levels so you can see that when she had reported first to us, uh, they were pretty high, uh, even at the baseline when she came to us. So the ALT was always higher than EST in all these. The bilirubin was normal, uh, pretty much. Yeah, it was always normal in all the, this thing, all the uh, readings which uh, have been given here. And we see that there was a progressive increase in the ALT as well as the EST through this month. So 1st uh, June to 27th June is what I have actually uh, this thing recorded put here. And on 27th June, rather, there was a slight decrease in the ALT as well as the AST. Her other reports were all normal. KFT we can see, but here we can see one point of concern that her platelet was also falling. So in the beginning, it was normal and then gradually it was falling. And because uh, she was diabetic also, and she had one or two readings of, you know, borderline blood pressure. So we got a bit confused whether she is developing health syndrome, as was discussed by Dr. Harsha also, that so many overlapping is there. So then uh, we did not actually know what uh, else to do, but we got the biomarkers, SFLT, PLGF ratio, which was in the normal range. And uh, that kind of reassured us that we can continue with our conservative management. So the serum bile acids, you can see the first time we did, it was 44.3. And then subsequently, again, after a week, it was 49. So these were her uh, important reports, which I have shared. And also her blood sugar charting, which actually when she came, they were rather, dis uh, they were uh, 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 very highly abnormal. And then uh, later on, she was started on insulin and they did show improvement. So you can see that all her blood sugar values later on came under control. So the uh, ultrasound had also been done, which showed that the baby is between the mean to the 75th centile and uh, the liver and the gallbladder were seen as normal. So the first question is to our young faculty, Dr. Kriti. She is a dermatologist 
and she is going to throw some light on what is the differential diagnosis of pruritus in pregnancy, which is such a common condition, which is seen in almost one fourth as we discussed. So, uh, Kriti, can you tell us about this? Thank you, ma'am, for the question. Uh, so this is one of the most important questions when the patients are referred to us from the gynae department uh, that why, what is this pruritus about? Will you label this as intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy? So for us to label it into that, we need to know the differentials about the same. So the pruritus can present with rash or it can present without rash. And then the conditions can be physiological as well as pathological. Most of the changes in the pregnancy can be just because of the dry skin, which is the physiological skin, which is happening, uh, changes which is happening during the pregnancy. And then if we look for the pathological condition, the most common pathological condition which we encounter is the atopic eruption of the pregnancy. So these are basically just the papular rash or the eczematous condition which we commonly see and it's a benign condition. It doesn't affect the fetus and it's a self-limiting condition and it starts in the early onset. So if we are labeling it as intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy, it usually begins in the little, uh, later trimester or it starts around the six month onset and there are no rash in it. So the conditions which can present with the rash is one is the atopic eruption of the pregnancy, which uh, starts in the early onset. There is typically the family history or the personal history of the atopy present. And the mother can also have increased IgE levels in her. And then there is generally an excoriation mark which can be seen. The second most important condition which we need to rule out this is the picture showing the excoriation and the papules, which are seen in the patient of atopic eruptions of the pregnancy. Ma'am, can you go back to the previous picture? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So this is again the differential in the late trimesters when the intrahepatic of cholestasis of pregnancy is suspected. This is a condition known as pruritic urticarial papules and plaques of pregnancy. In this, the female will be having only erythema or the wheels or the papules around the abdomen along the lines of striae gravidorum. And then there will be the periumbilical sparing. There are few conditions in which there is umbilical involvement also and the abdominal involvement. In this, there is predominantly the umbilic uh, periumbilical involvement sparing the center part. Ma'am, there is one more picture of the differential, which is very rare. The last condition which we can keep is the pemphigoid gestational. Is. This is again a late onset condition in which the vesicles are seen predominantly on the trunk and it can involve the umbilicus. And in this, the different, uh, diagnostic marker is the direct immunofluorescence test, which we do it by taking the skin biopsy. And when we do the skin biopsy, we will see the subepidermal bulla is seen and there is increased level of the IgG and C3 in the basement membrane zone. And this again is a self-limiting condition. It might continue post-pregnancy, but usually a benign condition. And the fetus can be a small for a date in this. Otherwise, it's a healthy condition and it won't affect the fetus. So intrahepatic uh, cholestasis of the pregnancy is the main condition which can affect the fetus. Yeah, I think Kriti, you have done a wonderful job and thank you so much for giving these uh, very, very, I think, self-explanatory pictures. I had also not seen such good, clear pictures which you shared, you know. So now I think all of us today will take home these images and I'm sure uh, our residents can also diagnose these very common conditions now very easily. Yeah. Uh, one more question, Kriti, from you. That, uh, okay, so you have told, this was also contributed by Dr. Kriti. I think you wanted to discuss that what is the cause of the pruritus in uh, these patients of ICP. 
Yes, ma'am. So basically, we always say that it's the bile acids which is abnormal in these patients of uh, intrahepatic cholestasis. But there are various other diagnostic markers also, which are again the pruritogenic uh, agents, which will cause the itch pathway stimulation. So one of the most recently done the uh, serum levels is of the autotaxin. So serum autotaxin has also been done nowadays in the cholestasis of uh, pregnancy in which it is elevated more than 40 millimoles. And this is helpful in differentiating it from the other causes of the pruritus in pregnancy. Usually bile acids, as ma'am had discussed before, there are various other conditions in which the bile acids will be raised. But autotaxin, Sin is a other differentiating marker, which will be uh, done with the help of a PCR. It's a serum marker. And this okay. can also so this be done. Be raised in the ICU. Yes, it ma'am. It's more a cholestasis marker. So it will be raised in ICU. Okay. So that's a very useful information, Kriti. And it is available as a PCR test, you said. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what are the other conditions leading to pruritus without any rash besides ICP? Ma'am, besides ICP, the other conditions which can be there is the coexisting conditions which a pregnant female can be having. She can be having an underlying liver disorders other than that renal disorder or a hypo or hyperthyroidism in which the usually the female will be having just dry skin and there will be no rash visible. Neither she will be complaining of her uh, eruptions which are happening. So she can just complain of a uh, rash uh, itching. Nothing other than that, there won't be any lesions. And underlying um, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's, if there is underlying malignancy, these are the conditions which can present. And mostly the nocturnal itching will be there. So as you must have seen your patients also complaining of nocturnal itch mm -hmm. in case of uh, intrahepatic cholestasis, and they will be saying there will be palms and soles involvement predominantly. Right. So uh, again, the Hodgkin's and the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients can also complain of a similar uh, thing that they have nocturnal itching or an evening itching. But these are the other pre-existing conditions. We won't label it as only um, differentials of this. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Kriti. We have been really enlightened with all the information you have given us. Thank you. So, yeah. So moving on to the next question, uh, Dr. Anjali, are there any pregnancy specific cutoffs for the LFT? We had just seen, you know, how the LFTs were in this case. And uh, what are the diagnostic criteria for ICP? Dr. Anjali, please. IHCP basically involves two conditions, and that is uh, pruritus without a rash and abnormal liver functions. Usually, uh, we are taking dialysis as the gold standard. And the other thing is transaminases. We have to exclude any other cause of these. And the most important thing is both the conditions should resolve after delivery, maximum by six weeks. As regarding transaminases, which is what we all are using mostly, that uh, ALT is the more specific, and uh, uh, the uh, many because of the increase in the um, plasma volume and to the especially to the liver, we usually take a lower twenty percent uh, lower level than pregnancy, but. Uh, any value which is above the normal non-pregnant uh, levels are taken as abnormal, even though there is a marginal decrease in the second and third uh, trimester in normal pregnancy of transaminases. Yeah, so uh, I think that message is very important for all, all of uh, us who are attending, that the ALT and AS, uh, out of these two, you said ALT has got a higher value and uh, yes, more specific for the ICP. Uh, and second thing, which important you said that mainly the ICP is a clinical diagnosis and uh, it may be associated with increased bile acids and increased transaminases. So uh, 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 what are the uh, bile level cut, uh, serum bile acid cutoffs, which normally you would like to take Dr. Anjali for diagnosing the ICP? The bile acid levels are usually taken more than 10 micromoles per liter, but a recent study says we can go up to even 19 micromoles per liter. And uh, levels more than 40 uh, increase risk of uh, 
um, meconium staining liquor and uh, preterm birth, but more than 100 micromoles per liter is critical and uh, there can be a sudden uh, IUD in such a case. Right. So that's, uh, I think, very, very important uh, information. And uh, uh, the study you were, I think we will be discussing that later, that in which the 19 cutoff has been used. Yes, so that is one of the recent studies which you have been telling us about. So, um, Dr. Angela, what are the causes of increased bile acids? Because uh, we are all now going in for bile acids. You said that in your practice, you do routinely the bile acid levels. But uh, there could be other causes also of increased bile acids besides ICP. And then, you know, we all want to know that what are the methods which are available for measurement? Are there any different uh, techniques? And, you know, how fast do we get reports? And when should we do the bile acid? So much of confusion is there. It should be done fasting or postprandial. So please throw light on all, all these, uh, Dr. Angela. Thank you, Dr. Josna, for having me for this wonderful panel discussion. So just before answering, I would like to take you back to our physiology days, you know. The bile acids yeah. are the metabolites of cholesterol, okay? This right. binds with glycine and the toluene, and then they are excreted in the gallbladder, and 80 to 90% of it stays in the gallbladder at the time of meals, okay? Like during that state. And only 10 to 20% is excreted continuously into your uh, duodenum. From there, it goes to ileum and then it's reabsorbed into a portal vein, goes back to your liver. So this one, which is absorbed, is seen as 10 to 20%. So if you do it fasting state, so your mm -hmm. levels are less. So that's the answer. When you do a fasting, you don't pick up the severity of intrahepatic cholestasis. So what happens when you take a meal, this 80 to 90 percent of the bile acids, which is present in the gallbladder, is also excreted into the duodenum. So now this whole gets absorbed and goes into the portal vein back to your liver. So if you take a postprandial state, okay, then the chances of getting more intrahepatic cholestasis, so you can diagnose more patients. So that is the basis behind the fasting and the postprandial. So now any abnormality in the excretion or in the re in the absorption will lead to increased bile acids, which is uh, which you can say, for example, if there is a, a, a common bile duct inflammation, any obstruction, gallstones over there, anything, uh, any tumor, which is a gallbladder tumor, or it's a cancer of a pancreas or a cancer into a uh, you know. Uh, in the liver can also lead to increased bile acids. Any primary sclerosing cholangitis, any primary sclerosing cirrhosis of the biliary tract, or any problem with the malabsorption, if there's a Crohn disease, uh, bile acids increases even in a viral hepatitis, but the amount is less as compared to the trans -hepatitis. So this is very important that you understand, and that forms the basis what to do next. You know, if the bile acids are higher, do an ultrasound and see how the liver is and how the gallbladder and the CBD is. And you might find out many problems related to that. So that forms the basis of, uh, you know, the increased causes of uh, intrahepatic uh, bile acids and except the intrahepatic cholestasis. Two, it's important to do uh, a random sample of bile acids. Since the study is out, we had all doing it postprandial. That is, if you do it after the lunch, then you can pick up more severe forms of uh, intrahepatic cholestasis of the pregnancy. By the study, they say if there's, uh, you say intrahepatic cholestasis, if bile acids are more than 10, you call it severe if it's more than 40. And you can pick up severe cholestasis only 9% if you do fasting bile acids, but you pick up more than 91% if you do a postprandial one. Yes. So it's difficult to do postprandial all the time. So best is do a random bile acid sample any time of the day, which is convenient to the patient as well as to the doctor. Right. I think that's a very, uh, very, very important and useful information. And uh, the study you said, which was published in 2021 and Dr. Anjali was also referring to this same study uh, in which she said that uh, they have even suggested that you can, you know, take the cutoffs as uh, 19. 
So first, I think we can also discuss that uh, the different methods, Dr. Yeah. Yula. So, you know, the enzymatic methods and the radio immune assays have a least uh, uh, TOT times. So in a, usually, you know, whatever we are sending in our private labs outside, they are giving the, us the reports in one day, you know. But if you do it by the spectrometry or by the liquid base, this thing, it takes at least four to seven days. So that doesn't help us. We need a result. If you, any test, if you send, you better get a result in 24 hours. Only then you can manage a patient. There is no point getting a test of uh, uh, 100 yeah. and you get the result in four days time. You know? right. Yeah. Yeah. So the advantage of those are that it gives a fractionated of chino deoxy yeah. folic acid and folic acid, but then when we are no not point. actually we need, using it uh, clinically, we so need so total no bile acid. That's better. Yeah. And yes, all these indeed. values which we are talking about 10, 40, 100, this is all total bile acid. Total really. bile acid. Yeah. And enzymatic methods will give us quick results. So yeah. I think as clinicians, we should look for labs which give us do the enzymatic method and give us the faster report. Yeah. So that is important. Yes. So uh, I think we have discussed this uh, very uh, nicely, this whole thing, and it should now not have any confusion for anyone that we can do the bile acids anytime, not fasting, but definitely random or any time after meals, we can do it when the patient comes to us. We can. We select. have picked up many cases when we have started doing post -prandial. Right. And it's very important if your bile acid is high, you know, don't try to repeat immediately to the another lab. That is your benchmark, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Madam Dr. K uh, Gujral, uh, <laughs> welcome for the this panel, Madam. So, uh, can we make the diagnosis of ICP in the presence of normal bile acids also? Because we have been talking so much about bile acids and then Suppose we do it and it's normal, then what do you think about Hi. that? Uh, thank you everyone for having me in this panel. Two, three things we'll say. Uh, although 1B recommendation, I buy lasses along with uh, enzymes, transaminase, and ALT, AST, NT. That's the hallmark. But clinical diagnosis is as important. We have patients who present classical itching, etc. No dermal lesions, no liver disease. We've excluded. Biolases are normal. You wait for a week or so, they will rise. So I would go for clinical. The question remains whether to start treatment. We'll talk about later. Now, since when we were discussing the, uh, so what I meant was bile acids is the recommendation, but clinical is as important. If you do not have the facility, you do not have the time, whatever it is. I want to draw the attention of the house to a very recent paper from Ames done by uh, Nutan Jain, yes. So what they have done is they have taken a uh, woman presenting with classical uh, sign symptoms of ICP. They've taken healthy pregnant controls with no symptoms and they've taken non-pregnant women. So surprisingly, and they've done fasting levels of bile acids. The mean fasting in the women who were symptomatic was 75. The mean fasting at, uh, level in the healthy control was 29. This is very high. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, please go. This is a Jogi uh, May-June paper. Okay. Just have to read. Okay. And the mean fasting level in non-pregnant was also 29. Okay. So what the authors say, it's a very last study, what the authors say that for Asian women, now this is the only report where I take 30 as a cut. Okay. I would be very scared to take 30 as a cut up. So I thought all this else has been discussed. I don't have to add anything to your question. But any one of you would think of 30 as a cut up. This is a study from That's a. so scary. That's, That's very, scary. Very, interesting. very, very interesting and very food for thought for food all of us. us. And that for Asian population. And, and yeah. they, they have done the stillbirth and fetal distress in the detailed study. And what they said, 200 is a level where they found the mortality. Yeah. So, almost, so they do say that it is 30 cut up for Asian women. That's a food for thought. So when you do this form, I think we should look at this. And they've done fasting. Okay. So when you do the ISCP registry, I think we should look at it. You know, and, and those were all normal women with no itching and no, no, no Yes, healthy control, normal, equal numbers. And for the uh, by, uh, the woman who had the bile acids, uh, the woman who was symptomatic, they started UDC and they okay. found that the levels were decreasing. For okay. the other women, they didn't start. And they right. haven't reported those women later developed, like I said, you know, because they didn't have itching. So this is a food for thought. And I think we should look at our own cut-up levels. Yes. Whenever we plan to do this study, we should have the healthy controls. 
whether yes. we call up uh, numbers are 75 and all, but we can uh, contribute much more yes. because asymptomatic women, we don't do bilateral. Yeah. Unless they present with symptoms. So that's the only change I wanted to bring. Otherwise, yes. diagnosis, you were all set. Yes. And uh, you just said that if the patient is the bile acids are not raised, you do it again after a week or two, they, you will find them raised. Yes, you will find so it has been suggested by some that don't start the UDC. Yes, until, I was going uh, to say. Know, yeah, so that, that will never be able to establish the diagnosis. Right. That is the only thing. Right. So if you want to establish the diagnosis, you got to wait. The fact that bile acids are normal means the thing is not severe and you do not have to worry. Yes. Unless you encounter one case at 38 weeks and where you have to decide between inducing and waiting, that's another part of the story. Right. But at that level will not cause any trouble. No. So I we always that, wait when we start. Absolutely. So it is a mild disease if bile acids yeah, are not so raised, so we can always wait for a week. Yeah. There is not going to cause any problem. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. So uh, we are going to now go to the second case where we will discuss a very, very challenging case which was managed uh, recently in our hospital. It was uh, Dr. Anjali's unit. They had this booked case. So this uh, lady was uh, Mrs. X, 30 year old uh, Gravita 4 Para 3 L1 lady at 34 weeks uh, at the moment when she came to us uh, recently. But uh, initially, the patient had presented to antenatal OPD at 26 weeks period of gestation with yellowish discoloration of eyes and itching over palms and soles since 10 days. And she also did not give any other history of fever, vomiting, pain, abdomen, headache, or anything suggestive of preeclampsia or any uh, uh, viral hepatitis or other, other uh, you know, conditions which we were discussing right now. Uh, her obstetric history was uh, very, very uh, disturbing because this lady was married for eight years and uh, the first uh, pregnancy she had ended with a preterm vaginal delivery at 30 weeks. Uh, the baby weight was 1.6 kg and she gave history that at 28 weeks she started having itching as well as jaundice. And uh, then she had a spontaneous preterm birth at 30 weeks. That baby uh, is alive. But after that, she had two more pregnancies. The second baby at eight months, uh, she had a preterm vaginal IUD delivery at home. The birth weight was not known to her. And even after that, another, she had a neonatal death, early neonatal death. The baby just was born and died immediately after birth at seven months. And in both these pregnancies, again, she gave history of jaundice. So in spite of these, you know, she had not come for antenatal care in her second and third pregnancy. And finally, at 26 weeks, she came to our hospital OPD with the history of jaundice and itching for last 10 days. So this was her history. Uh, so the past medical history, she did not give any history of chronic liver disease or any other medical disorder. And family history was also not suggestive. There was no similar complaint in family members. So the investigations, if you can see, I have highlighted the LFT. When she came to us the first time, she had a high bilirubin of seven, and she also had a, a ALT of 122. Uh, later on, you know, with time, we can see that her bilirubin was going back to normal, and even her enzymes were uh, recovering. And finally, you know, uh, towards the end, they were pretty much coming to the normal range. Of course, the ALT always remained high. And the bile acids, if you see at uh, the time, first time she came on 23rd May, when it was done, it was 201. And later on 11th uh, June, it was 49. And then 16th July, again, it was done. It was 68. Her coagulation profile was normal throughout. And other investigations were all within normal limit. So the other interesting and noteworthy thing in her investigations, when she came to us, uh, then in uh, that time we had ordered all her viral markers and her anti-HEP-A IgG was positive on 4-6, which, uh, you know, was probably the reason why she presented with the jaundice. So the otherwise her ultrasound whole abdomen, there was a mild uh, hepatomegaly and there was no evidence of any dilated biliary radical. So the diagnosis we made at present, that is 
the diagnosis the second time when she was admitted it was g4 p3 l1 with 34 weeks pregnancy with icp with moderate anemia with resolved jaundice so uh, with this case uh, you know i want to discuss with dr angela that what are the causes of jaundice in pregnancy thank you dr josna like uh, the jaundice it's very important one should read a report properly whether it's a, a conjugated or an un unconjugated rise in the bilirubin because that's the only way one can differentiate between the uh, causes you know so if you look into it i have already discussed the biliary obstruction then the second thing comes is your intrahepatic cholestasis of uh, cholestasis which can be because of the cr chronic persistent hepatitis kind of thing maybe that is the reason but in this in this patient of yours who has got always the jaundice you always know can. and uh, you know even in this pregnancy of course igg was positive you know mm -hmm. but over the time you can't say hepatitis a has caused uh, jaundice in all previous three Uh, pregnancies exactly so it looks like this this kind of a thing is something genetic related to it hmm. you know so maybe hmm. there is a chronic persistent active hepatitis or there is a some kind of a viral hepatitis or there is some kind of a biliary thing it's very difficult so you have to see biliary you have to see hepatic you have to see some kind of uh, you know hepatocellular injury which can be acute or a chronic some kind of a drug she has taken whether steroid ampicillin septron you don't know what she has taken but repeated jaundice in every pregnancy accounts for something which is a congenital you know so that becomes a little so one needs Don't to investigate these becomes, kind yeah. of a patient little more right. because it's not easy thing you know it can yeah. be some kind of a dubin johnson syndrome or a rotor syndrome which one can diagnose later on by doing some kind of a biopsy right. you know but uh, you know the the way the bilirubin improved later yeah. in pregnancy uh -huh. maybe in this particular pregnancy there was a hep a yeah, igg right. but why jaundice happened in previous three pregnancies yes, yes that is what exactly so angela it is the history which the patient said yeah. we really don't know how significant maybe she had yeah. itching and someone told her there must be mild uh, mildly increase we yeah. really don't know because yeah. this is the history which she gave us yeah. and uh, if it was one of these as you were suggesting maybe you know Uh, the jaundice would have definitely persisted throughout yeah. the pregnancy yeah. so and then you know once the jaundice as your slide says you know it's very important uh, uh, the reading of lft and then always keep three important conditions in your mind one is the health one is the hemo hemolytic uremic syndrome you can even look for ttp your uh, uh, your thrombocytes are problem and acute right. fatty liver of pregnancy right and uh, you know that everybody says uh, you know in uh, intrahepatic cholestasis enzymes uh, ast and lt are never two times more than the upper limit i think we always see more than two times of the upper limit only yes i think it's very important to have your own indian data uh, yeah. you know with the 50 60 we are not worried our patients yeah. always have 200 250 400 right. without any viral hepatitis correct so yeah. that is again and again Uh, giving the importance of our own indian data because yeah. we all see that the levels of uh, uh, you know transaminases are pretty high in our patients even with icp so the, here like the what you were saying you know so if it is ast alt which are predominantly high we normally think of hepatitis or yes. toxin yes. and if it is the uh, you know the ggt or the serum bilirubin and alp then you think of a cholestatic problem yes. Yeah. So that is, I think, the way you. So have even keep like your own help and uh, yeah. you know acute fatty liver, TTP and HUS in your mind, and just keep on excluding one by one. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think we have a very very difficult question for Dr. Seema. So Dr. Seema, you are there. Yes. Yes, Dr. Jansen. Yeah. Welcome, Dr. Seema. Yes. Yeah. So this you. case, uh, you know, this was a very big challenging case for us. so uh, we would like you to uh, discuss about the genetic basis for I icp dr angela also suggested that there must be some genetic basis so what do you so, think about this case yeah. so the intrahepatic cholestasis you know the birth uh, is mainly the genetic is deciphered from the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis which is a disease usually of the newborn or infant infant uh, period where there will be severe progressive liver failure 
and this is a disease of uh, defective bile acid secretions which dr angela has already highlighted that the bile is formed from cholesterol and then from the hepatocytes this is sent to the bile canaliculi through these transports so all the mutations which cause the intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy or the pfic that is the progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis they are usually the mutation in these transport proteins and there are a couple of you know atp binding cassette proteins and the most the maximum mutation is accounted by the abc b4 gene which you have highlighted so overall it has been reported that about 20% of the cases of the ihcp have the genetic basis so and this mutation in abc b4 is accounts for about 10% of the cases followed by abc b11 the genetic study on ihcp is you know a recent uh, you know development so we don't have enough data available for others like you know the atp b18 and all so but the maximum is found by the abc b4 and which accounts for 10% so the question arises why do we want genetic testing here mm. is it, it is a self limiting condition it is going to resolve so as per the literature it has been found that you know there is a 3 to 5 times increased risk of the other liver disorders like you know the gallstones the cancers so probably making a genetic testing is you know maybe prudent at this stage but maybe it's an infancy we are also not doing you know so probably as per you know your study which we are showing saying probably we can reach we can start this study of the genetic testing for ihc thank you i think uh, this was a very useful information that even if for this pregnancy we don't need the genetic testing but for her future prognos prognosticating her future uh, you know uh, the risk for liver disorders it may be wise to do it yeah. for such a patient who has been recurrently having uh, the icp do you find such patients in your practice dr seema yeah i you know ihcp i have been see you know sometimes in cases of stillbirth and sometimes in cases of you know anti cardiolipin antibody syndromes so most of them you know uh, you, you know i didn't find them as as high as 100 so but yes uh, i do find but being a geneticist not as a large number of cases i will only see see at the last end of the you know the, when they have typical problems of stillbirth right thank you so much so uh, dr anjali we are back to you what are the risks to the fetus and the mother uh, this case uh, which you managed in your unit only so what were the things in the back of your mind when you were taking care of her so and as we all know it is mostly uh, the fetus which is affected the mother's quality of life is affected because the her night time sleep in uh, severe cases is affected because of the itching of her i mean mostly of uh, palms and soles or even the whole body and there may be some associated uh, gdm or preeclampsia seen in such cases there is for the fetus uh, there is a high risk of spontaneous or iatrogenic preterm labor and uh, meconium staining like uh, as then uh, as the gestational age increases and the bile acid levels rise and uh, sudden iud's are not seen in so many cases only around 0.8 to 1% but uh, if the child is born preterm then all the problems of uh, preterm uh, delivery like nicu admissions are they all increase and like in this case because it was an early onset uh, case uh, with the previous episodes i think there is a strong genetic uh, uh, link in her case and some studies have found even a 20% risk in cases where there is an early onset and uh, such cases have are prone later on besides to gallstones cholangitis cirrhosis and even carcinoma of gall bladder and bile duct so that are the problems for the mother yeah thank you dr anjali so it's not pph we have not seen yeah that. yeah it's not very significant and what you said and about the time we did uh, in our hospital where we there were either preterm labors or iatrogenic deliveries our cesarean rates were uh, astonishingly not very high because it even the mycelium becomes very sensitive because of the yeah. bile acids to oxidizes yeah. so they do go into labor very fast labor very easily yeah that's a very important observation so uh, uh, basically the uh, you know we uh, when we saw the literature it is said that uh, there is a five fold increase uh, in the diagnosis of preeclampsia in women with icp 
so lot of the morbidity uh, which we see there may be overlapping also and many times you know so even in our first case we had got the uh, plgf the uh, uh, sflt plgf ratio because the bp was slightly higher side she had gdm also so there is uh, these things are there in this and one more thing that the diagnosis of preeclampsia occurred in most of the cases in the study which they have quoted in the sfm uh, guidelines they say that it occurred 2 to 4 weeks after the diagnosis of icp and proteinuria preceded elevated bp in all cases so maybe it's a very good idea to follow these patients uh, of icp regularly we do their albumin levels which nowadays has taken a little back seat because albumin is now not considered very important uh, for prognosis but uh, still it has its very important values in some cases so uh, dr anjali has told us all these uh, i think uh, conditions which we are worried about for both the fetus as well as the mother so dr anjela now that we are thinking that this there is a lot of problem in this pregnancy what do you suggest how should we do the maternal and fetal monitoring uh you know i will like to see this mother on a weekly basis and i will do her lft and bile acids weekly you know and uh, and i will see whether she is improving with her symptoms or not it's usually one or two weeks time she improves with her symptoms and it takes 3 to 4 weeks at least to take the biochemical picture to improve okay and the most important thing for me is if her symptoms have improved and the uh, biochemical things have not improved then there is no need to increase your the dose of urodeoxycholic acid so as far as the fetus is concerned that is more bothersome why because as dr anjali has already said there is a sudden why we are worried we are worried about stillbirth which doesn't happen because of the chronic placental insufficiency it's a sudden event like if a bile acid ex on the myocytes it lead to the arrhythmias and baby can die because of the failure heart failure or if it acts on the chronic uh, chorionic vessels then it sudden it can lead to ischemia and the baby calcium. can die and there is not even a single test which can predict which fetus is at risk of adverse outcome so that is the problem so it's very important that you should counsel your patient tell her to keep a uh, kick count chart see on her on a weekly basis do her non stress test do her biophysical profile we do even dopplers and keep her under close observation if the patient who has is a case of a severe intrahepatic cholestasis that is well, more than 40 then i will like to see her twice a week okay and you would like to repeat her bile acids how often uh, we do it weekly basis okay lft and bile acid you would like we do to weekly basis weekly basis yeah, yeah. okay and you know in between like if you as you have said and we have already also seen the risk of preeclampsia i do in after 2 weeks or 3 weeks i do a cbc also just check on her hemoglobin and check the status of her uh, uh, you know uh, what do you say uh, the platelets you know right. and and keep an eye and ask her if there is a jaundice examine her properly if need we do an ultrasound of upper abdomen for liver and gall bladder and if she gives a history of steatorrhea there is no harm doing a coagulation profile for her Yeah. and we can also do a uh, 24 hour urine protein also I yeah uh, yeah so we don't do 24 hour urine to protein do the to creatinine to protein creatinine uh, yeah urine protein creatinine ratio yeah yeah theek yeah. hai so some some method of uh, protein urea whatever is one we are doing we should be doing that also so the i think very important part of this panel that how do we treat this patient uh, dr gujral yeah thank you uh, thank you josna well the treatment is known udc is the drug of choice 10 to 15 mg per kg the body weight 300 mg either three times or 450 mg twice a day makes it more comfortable for patient remember that uh, it will take about one to two weeks for itching to improve and that pruritus to improve and that is your hallmark that there is an improvement biochems are going to do three to four laters and as the panelist said if the initial levels are high you can repeat in a weeks time if the initial levels are not high i would go by the itching you know if the that has improved everything will improve if after 2 3 weeks it be a 2 weeks or so it has not improved the biochemicals and the itching then you increase the dose to 20 now if that also there are no really no side effects of this medicine if that also does not improve 
we have used SAM. The trade name is Heptral. The tablet is 400 milligram, about three times a day, 1,000 to 1,200 is a dose, and that really helps. The, I, there's not much uh, said about uh, uh, yeah. Heptral, but we, our gastro people are very fond of it. The moment the bilases rise after UDC and they're not improving, you know, the patient is not comfortable. We've added heptrol quite often. And we found is, good... what is the name? Heptrol. Heptrol, H E P T R L. That's a trade name. And okay. SAP is the word 400 milligrams. Yeah. So we have actually, we don't have any experience with the SAM. Ah, we not... have a good experience okay. of heptrol. Currently, I have one of them admitted with heptrol on. She just yeah. improved and now she's almost 36. Okay. So the bilas it does fall. Heptrol so that... is, okay. uh, Dr. Gujral, heptrol is LGS adenosyl with you. Yes. Yes. yes, it is SAP. Because they say it should be given. IV actually in the in the literature I read. Yeah. yeah, that was for very severe cases. And but how much you give, Doctor? Uh, four hundred milligram is a tablet. Let me cross check. Yeah, four hundred milligrams a tablet. Thousand eight hundred is a dose. So BD will eight hundred to thousand. So four hundred uh, twice a day will be eight hundred, and maximum the the dose used has been sixteen hundred also. Okay. So two or three tablets, we good experience. So tablet. it is a standalone treatment, like uh, yeah, once stop. they don't respond with UDC. Yeah, once so with the UDC, no, no, but with the UDC, UDC. UDC. Yeah. not standalone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so this this is what I wanted to give a message. We used quite often and be happy with it. Well, that's, very, not that's very nice to know because there are few, you are absolutely right, there are very few patients yeah. which don't respond. Yeah, and then it makes it better. So now our residents are so fond of it that even without waiting for three days, there's right hip run. When okay. I take it round, I find a prescription, you know, then I say, okay. no, let's go size. Yeah, so now, that's uh, a very, very important. Yeah. I think for someone who has got an experience of the yeah. drug, now we feel more confident that we can order because we have only read about it and yeah. we are not using this yeah. drug. So cholesterol any side effects not it has any side effects you have seen? No, we not experienced, not experience. okay. well tolerated. In fact, that's the beauty. They have a GI disorder, GI is well tolerated. That's where I look at it. And okay. cholesterol we've not used, though they say that it does improve. Rifampicin yeah. I've read in the literature, uh, you know, but we've not used rifampicin. And uh, Seema was talking about uh, gene mutation. The recommendation is rifampicin is appropriate in the women who have a gene mutation. That means they're at a high risk of adverse. Yeah. And currently, non-pregnant women, good response. Pregnant women, only 30 patients uh, with a good yes. response. Yes. So I think the uh, we've used it for tuberculosis, and you have used it more often than yeah. that. Now, as somebody said, I think you said it in the panel, he does UDC improve perinatal outcome. Unfortunately, the answer is yeah. no. So that's this is the very important with this trial. Yeah. yeah. See, Cochrane Review 2013 said preterm birth decrease. Then came a very nice meta-analysis, 12 trials, and they were so happy. Preterm, fetal distress, RDS, all decreased. And then when the first randomized versus placebo control, the Pitches trial or Pitches, whatever you call it, came, it said no thing except the maternal itch, itching is improved, tested by standard itch score. So yeah. if the mother is happy, I guess that makes it okay. But I don't know, when we use the drug, the bile acids do fall. So I look at it, they use the drug, bile acid falls, bile acid falls, your perinatal outcome improves. So whichever, but the uh, trials are against it's only maternal uh, well-being. And another meta-analysis in 2020 also said the same thing, the same methods as the updated meta-analysis. But there was a very nice article, BGO, BJOG in 2021, where he said, hey, how can we just write it does not uh, improve? We don't know what was the dosage. We don't know right. what was the baseline bilateral. We don't know right. what is the compliance of the patient. Exactly. What are the thresholds? So how can you say it doesn't improve? Exactly. Yes, again, clinically, I feel when the bilateral fall, the fetus gets better. Yes. This is the way. Fetus has better yes. chances. So you yes. can prolong the gestational age. And with today's, uh, you know, pressure on the late, uh, uh, late preterm and early term births, I think if we can take to 37, you'd be happy. Uh, yeah. and I, I would like to make a comment here. You know, this speeches trial, their patients are monitored so well. Uh -huh. that, you know, they wouldn't have higher incidence in the patients who have uh, cholestasis or you don't have because all the patients are monitored so well. It's yeah. not the case in uh, our yeah. kind of setup. So we can't really say that you deliver does not yeah. help. So as I said, if the, bi the bile yeah. acids fall, there's no doubt about that. And yeah. once they fall, the mother is better, the fetus is better. They, so in fact, they better. found that bile acids also did not fall. Yeah, they and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but they also admitted the limitation of their yeah. study. Yeah, that, that only 25% of the patients had a uh, total bile acid of more than 40. Yeah. So the others all had a mild disease. So they themselves yeah. said that 
we can't actually generalize and as uh, madam has also said that uh, you know with the kind of monitoring and all even though you know the the, the different uh, population and different place definitely uh, we can't generalize this to all and as clinicians we still find that it is effective at least as far as the patient's Absolutely. comfort level goes we know that she is very much relieved and we have seen bile acids also falling okay. but one more thing is that it measures the uh, it, it itself is uh, you know when you measure the bile acid the udc is also measured so that also is important that uh, after you start the treatment uh, the 60% of the bile acid which is measured is contributed by the udc so yes. that also the clinicians yeah. have to remember and can of I, course, apply I, local treatment, not to forget the local 100 treatments are there, not to forget. Starting with Nadirdale and everything else. <laughs> Jyotsha, can I just comment? Yes, yeah. 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 So, two things. See, once uh, the bile acid you have seen is more than 100, then there is no recommendation that you should uh, um, recheck again whether it's going up or it's going down because it really does not have uh, uh, any bearing on the decision making. And if the bile acids come down, that doesn't mean the, the baby yeah. is uh, free of yeah. risk now. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so bile acids are only uh, relevant when they are we are doing assessment until they reach up to 100. Once they have crossed the 100, they are, it is a uh, you know, very severe disease or means uh, very relevant and uh, uh, outcome is going to be uh, you know worse yeah. than if it I is think yes. that's a very important yeah. message Doctor, yeah, no doubt ranjana the recommendation to repeat the bilas is only once they're 100 it is recommended in most of the guidelines that if the bilas are 100 and above repeat in a week's time so you got to repeat it it may not help in prognosis but whatever uh, and you cannot I like think, you yeah. a 32 weaker at uh, 32 weaker at 100 bile acid. I'm going to repeat it to know how much I can prolong. No, but no? Uh, but actually that has been studied, and they say it's a we should not prolong a pregnancy or uh, you know decide on rising after a hundred. So actually, you know what I, I think need to say no, after no, no, a hundred. No, 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 it's not like it is reaching, and and if there is a liver, um, uh, you know, um, uh, what you say, it's affecting the liver, then we will go by the liver enzymes. You know, if the liver um, uh, function tests are showing deterioration, then you 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 know um, expedite the delivery. Right. I think uh, the message that the engineer is giving that if after hundred it falls, also don't take it that the patient has yeah. improved or you can carry on. So your Decision Neither. about termination should be uh, on the maximum yeah. level. Which the function test. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, like Thank we you. have patients who had 20 weeks, 122. You know, the bile acids are 122. We need to keep an eye on the bile acids and liver enzyme where we are heading for. Because, uh, you know, all these are, uh, all these parameters are related to term or near term. But there is no bile acid data which is available for the criteria, the cutoff when to deliver for a earlier patients like 22, 24, 26, there's no cutoff for them. Right. No, that's very so, true. So, have to inform the patient to, you have about to, the highest situation. Up to, that you even have to we go up to 34 weeks at least. Yes. If the but, liver um, uh, bile acids have crossed 100, still there is no recommendation that you deliver them now. Yeah. You can wait until 34 weeks yes. and then up to 30, 34 weeks, you have to go by the liver function test. Yeah, so I think uh, we carry on with the few thing. questions which are left. We are running late and we have to do the guidelines also. So a uh, role of vitamin K is also no, there. Yes, if yeah. there is a derange yeah. in the uh, derangement in the prothrombin time, so then only otherwise routinely it is not advisable. And we give the water-soluble vitamin K, menin Menardiol, sodium, it is, you can give it uh, even orally, but normally in our hospital, we are giving it uh, IEM or IV. Yeah, Both of them are acceptable. And uh, of course, this was the summary. So, uh, madam, again, this question is yeah. for you. When will you deliver this patient? Timing of delivery, mode of delivery? See, this is uh, the most difficult part in IHCP. Hmm. Now, every society is going to have the guidelines sooner. Uh, Somebody is going to speak on it that level 136 weeks, Society of Fetal Medicine is the smartest one. Level 100, 
36. Less than 100, you know, uh, from uh, 36 to 38.6, yes, right. depending on what is the level, the level is on this side, increase the gestation level is on the higher side, decrease the gestation age. RCOG 37, up to date, uh, differentiates between uh, less than 40, 40 to, uh, 40 to 99 and 100. But once again, I'm coming back to that paper. This paper gave recommendation of called as Newton score. Please, all of you go and read it. What they did, they biolysis less than 40, zero score, 42, less than 81, 82, less than 122, one tw more than 120 to 203, and 200 and more is four. That is the biolysis. The MR trans is less than 100, zero, 100 to 200, less than 201, 200 to 402, uh, and four to five, and 504. And then they did the uh, bilirubin. 0.8 less than 0 0.80 and then 0 0.8 to 1, 1, which we normally get, and then 2, 3, 4, like 1.1 to 2, 2, 2.5. So total score, they said, if it is 0, which means your bile acids are less than 40, your transmanases are normal, your bilirubin is less than, normal means less than 100, and the bilirubin is less than 8. They say do outpatient, start monitoring in 36 weeks and deliver at 38 weeks. Total score 1. One means either your bilateral are between 40 and 80 or your bilateral is less than 40, but your transaminases and bilirubin, that is uh, more than 100 and that is more than uh, 0.8. So they recommend 34 weeks uh, monitoring and 37 to 37.6 and as the score increases and four score is, uh, you know, then only you deliver at 34 weeks and four means bilateral is 200 and above. So this paper is totally changed the concept that what should be our baseline level, when should we deliver. So when again we form this, this is an Indian paper coming from uh, Ma'am, how many, papers, uh, uh, what was the uh, number of patients they studied? Uh, I'll just get to 75, because, I think. I know this one. I just got the journal with me. I just sent so Josna, it gives us a lead, you know. Uh, yeah, it gives us a lead that we need to can work. validate it and do more uh, patients yeah. and you know, if we can really. Yeah. 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 No, no. It's yeah. a large yeah. number. This is I, 71 IHCP, 50 pregnant healthy control, 35 non-pregnant. So it's not a small number. Yeah, so, it's a pretty good number. Yeah. So yeah. suppose when you form a formulated thing, we do all this in this manner and see what is our baseline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have it's never it's a good yeah. idea. It's a very From good that idea. is here we can begin, you know. So we can have a you know something template for us. We can begin from here. Yeah, and they say two hundred is a level where you're going to have yeah. IC not earlier than that. So here in this yeah. patient particularly, Doctor ah. Anjali, when did you deliver her? Thirty-four plus four days. Yeah. So yeah. your patient now has become thirty-four weeks, and the only thing ultrasound was done at twenty-seven weeks. So what is the ultrasound now? It will be add on to our management. Yeah, no, the uh, ultrasound was regularly done. Doctor Anjali just told us. At huh. 34 plus 4, they have already, they have because of her, previous, her own history and her levels, one level had already come as 200 and her pruritus was not decreasing even with you deliver. You know, it was, she was very uncomfortable. So, you so should those deliver. are the indications yeah. that you can terminate before 36. Yeah, because yeah, she, had, and she had previous stillbirth deaths. and previous yeah. stillbirth. Yeah, and her her history her. Was also like, yeah. I think we were totally justified and what was the baby weight and the baby is doing well, I think. Yeah, and the best thing was there was no meconium staining like her. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. thought she'll have some meconium staining like her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, less than 36 weeks only, this kind yeah. of history. We're very yeah. scared to sit on her, absolutely. Yeah. And the levels so, have risen. Yeah, by yeah. 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 Uh, so, Dr. Seema, we are here. Back to you. So, uh, yes. what, what counseling would you like to do for such a patient and risk of recurrence for her? It's with this genetic basis we are suspecting for yeah. this. So, uh, most of the, you know, the biliary transport mutations in ABCB4 or APCB11, you know, they are autosomal dominant conditions. So the risk to the children would be, you know, 50%. But here, this is a condition where I'm not bothered much about the risk in the kids, rather than the risk of reference, which you have said that for the mother, it is as high as 90%. So the risk is ma mainly for her or her sisters, you know, rather than, you know, talking about the children, because which is not practical, which is not relevant here. But yes, if we talk of the children, the risk of uh, recurrence would be as 50% uh, because this is an autosomal dominant condition. And the other thing which came up in my mind, because we studied all these intrahepatic cholestasis through the PFIC. 
in practice also i have seen lots of children with progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis that is the liver disorders and that is one of the big demand for prenatal diagnosis for the you know the clinical geneticists because these are tough conditions to diagnose so uh, you know we have the carrier status of these present in the mother and suppose she passes on to her children and the father or the would be husband is also a carrier so then this is an autosomal recessive disease which will lead to the serious condition so like you know whenever we talk about the cystic fibrosis we always see that you know the partner should be screened those who know the fertility genetics then they so similar to that probably it comes to my mind that if you find that there is a you know familial recurrences and all so the family should be screened for this biliary transport mutations thank you i think uh, that's a very useful information so uh, we go to the uh, last question for this case uh, dr anjali what about the contraceptive counseling and i think we have already discussed uh, you have told before that what are the risks for this patient uh, as far as her own liver health is concerned so if you could just tell us about con contraception also for her uh, in this in this case we would prefer non hormonal contraception uh, lamb like we always tell all the patients and uh, iucd and uh, in the new um, we have chaya but i don't think we can give chaya to her because of the liver uh, disease and uh, though uh, uh, for as regard as regarding ocs they say we should not give in uh, case of cholestasis because there is a risk of recurrence but then you have to weigh your risk benefit ratio and uh, according to certain guidelines we can still give low dose ocs to these people and uh, provided the liver function tests are normal at this time and we can follow up with the liver function test every 3 to 6 months or if she come and or if she complains of itching we can stop it and yeah. even progesterone only pills we can give and uh, dimpa also we can give yeah so uh, the who mec has placed the history of cholestasis which is pregnancy related as category 2 and the past coc related as category 3 so if it is a coc related we will not give her estrogen containing pills but if it is only pregnancy related we may try and as you suggested if she gets pruritus or we will carefully monitor her lft and in case she gets pruritus we should immediately stop and then not give again in the future the uh, estrogen containing uh, uh, cocs but the main thing which is concerning us is chaya i think we can't give yeah. her chaya also and also we yeah because of liver yeah. life long yeah. i only want to say that we should follow up these women life long we should not say yeah. that now she's finished with her to follow them. and just one very last study 1 lakh swedish women 11000 icp icp subsequently uh, you know uh, odds ratio 3.6 hepatobiliary carcinoma diabetes mellitus 1.5 thyroid 1.3 crohn's 1.6 cardiovascular disease because of the hypertension also was seen in women women who had preeclampsia So I think, like we follow our gestational diabetics or we preeclampsia, we should follow up these women. That's actually one, a thing. Yeah, and one recommendation was that hepatitis C is the underlying cause in many. So you should screen her for hepatitis C because today the treatment of HCV is much different from what it was earlier. Today it's a fully treatable, recoverable disease. So if you screen these women for C, actually we always do C in pregnancy when she comes, but still you should screen and. prevented by the medication we prevent the progression by medication that's all yeah so thank you uh, very much dr dubran for all, all this information all yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know i'm little one surprise sorry to say here you know in intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy i have seen the incidence of eph is more as compared to others and uh, there is a little little oozing even if you are doing a cesarean section the little little oozing keeps on happening and mm -hmm. this all stops once you give a tranexamic acid yeah. yeah i don't know i, I think that yeah. i love I to think... give my patients vitamin k i don't tell a lie because uh, no we know, all give angela we we also give so yeah, you know you also uh, give it you know to you... face a pph and then uh, yeah. uh, do something you know Uh, you know, like we are all evolving with the times. We were so scared at forty, forty uh, cardiac toxic baby will die, and we used to deliver. No, so this is all. It could yeah. be the genetic basis and yes. depends on our racial tendency for bleeding. So I think uh, what we have observed and what you are telling is perfectly justified. We also when you know, sometimes in the pregnancy, the transaminases, yeah. the transaminases are just going up. 
yeah. you know, 200 next time 400 next yeah. then 600 i have given vitamin k and they have gone they have gone down so yeah. i was very happy in continuing with so, you know uh, so uh, dr sumitra i think we have we are running short of time and uh, we need this last 5 minutes we have to give for the total review yeah. of the guidelines dr sumitra has prepared it very beautifully she has gone through all the guidelines so dr sumitra over to you to complete this wonderful panel yes ma'am uh, good evening everyone and uh, thank you for this opportunity to be part of such an esteemed panel uh, the guidelines have put in them in a tabulated form uh, the most recent one is of course the smfm the society of maternal fetal medicine and uh, uh, going to the guidelines uh, of course one thing i would say is that after uh, listening to such an intense discussion Uh, the guidelines are there to guide us, but I suppose every case needs to be individualized. So, uh, coming to the diagnosis, the all the guidelines are of course on the same platform. That pruritus is the um, uh, uh, symptom required for a clinical diagnosis. So, pruritus must be present, and as uh, has been discussed, maybe specifically for the palms and soles also. And other than that, uh, the RCOG recommends that. and a trans aminases are required for diagnosis as well as the european uh, you know uh, which is the european association for the study of the liver they recommend that the increased alt is very specifically diagnostic for uh, icp the other guidelines uh, do not recommend to be used as a diagnosis uh, factor but uh, if it is increased it is supportive uh, coming to the bile acids uh, again uh, it is the smfm Uh, which says that it is supportive along with the clinical uh, presence of uh, pruritus the increase in bile acid more than 10 cut off has been specified is a supportive uh, feature for diagnosing icp the australian uh, guideline definitely asks for bile acid for establishing a diagnosis however rcog does not and it says that if it is present it will be uh, an additional factor for diagnosis although not required so bile acids supportive only for the australian diagnostic and the alt diagnostic for uh, from rcog and the european so that is regarding the diagnosis and uh, the ggt again uh, if done can be uh, supportive so next slide please now coming to the uh, laboratory evaluation like how after establishing a diagnosis then uh, if one has done only lft then definitely bile acids should be done all uh, guidelines do recommend and uh, amongst these uh, ggt is uh, definitely one of the ones which have been recommended to be more specific uh, coming to the pt time the guideline uh, recommends the european guideline that it should be done if lft is severely deranged otherwise no other guideline is recommending the pt time what about the subsequent evaluation should they be done weekly or when should it be repeated so very uh, you know clearly rcog and the australian guideline says that lft should be done weekly and uh, if the lfts are deranged then pt should be done otherwise uh, in the initial workup if the lft was normal and if the pruritus persists then it should be repeated SMFM uh, does not recommend that a weekly bile acid or a weekly LFT has to be done. Uh, coming to the antepartum and the antenatal care, uh, there are as such no recommendations regarding how many times the patient should be followed up or uh, you know how many times she has to be seen. So there are no such recommendations. However, regarding the delivery time, and that has also been very clearly discussed. Uh, the RCOG recommends 37 weeks. It does not talk about the levels of the bile acid. The Australian recommends 38 weeks if it is severe disease. Then earlier also prior to 38 weeks if the bile acids are more than 100. Again, on every uh, guideline is on the same platform except for SMFM, which has given a breakup. And uh, if the bile acids are more than 100, then it says 36 weeks, and it also says that you should give antenatal corticosteroids. prior to you know the delivery if you are delivering a woman at 36 weeks and uh, if it is between 40 to 100 then consider delivery between 37 to 38 weeks and if less than 40 then even till 39 weeks but again case should be individualized because if there is uh, you know severe pruritus or the lfts are 
rising, uh, shooting up, or if there is a history of previous stillbirth, then one needs to individualize such cases. Next, please, ma'am. So uh, again, regarding the intrapartum care, one recommendation for RCOG from RCOG is continuous feeding heart rate monitoring. And uh, again, a PT time from the Australian guideline. Uh, regarding the use of also deoxycholic acid, all the guidelines give a similar dosage. So I need not go into the detail of that. What about vitamin K? Uh, the guidelines say that vitamin K only if there is prolonged PT time, mm -hmm. RCOG as well as the Australian, as well as the European. And uh, in case of also steatoria, one can consider vitamin K has to be water soluble. What about the use of dexamethasone? Not as a first line, but as I said, that SMFM recommends the use of dexamethasone if you're considering a delivery prior to 37 weeks for fetal lung maturity. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the supportive and additional uh, drugs like uh, I think Dr. Gujral, madam, also discussed the use of SAM and the use of cholestyramine and the use of rifampicine has been recommended. If the UDCA, the response is not adequate, so we may consider these. And uh, I think the experts have shared their own experience based on it, but this is what the guidelines recommend that yes, these drugs can be considered. Uh, regarding the post-delivery care, hormonal contraception already discussed, uh, mostly uh, RCOG is not recommending, SMFM is okay with it, breastfeeding can continue. And when should we repeat? We, should we or should we not repeat? So coming to that, uh, RCOG recommends that LFT should be repeated at six weeks postpartum. Australian recommends at four weeks. The American College of uh, Gastroenterologists recommend that you have to evaluate for other pathologies if the symptoms are persisting even six weeks post delivery. Similar is with the European. The SMFM, however, recommends that do an LFT only if the itch persists. So that is what is the recommendation from the guidelines. So thank you very much. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Good. So thank you very much to all my panelists. And now I look forward to the comments by our experts. First, I would like to ask Dr. Ranjana Sharma to comment on uh, the panel and some uh, inputs from her side. I think Dr. Ranjana okay. has probably left. It, uh, no, no, she's here. You. She's very yeah. much here. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you very much, um, Achala, Josna, you know, Dr. Tamkeen, all the organizing team to give me this opportunity. And, you know, we've become so um, interested suddenly in IHCP over the last couple of years. Suddenly, you know, I think everybody's knowledge has increased. So it was so a wonderful panel. I can't, uh, you know, praise more. Like uh, I have no words to say how well, you know, uh, Dr. Kaval Gujral, who's always very to the point and very, um, you know, exhaustive and uh, clear picture she gives and she did a good job. And Angela, you, you are always very, very clear. And I know whenever we need a good discussant, you discussant, you are there. And uh, similarly, Dr. Seema Thakur, you know, threw light on it very well and uh, there were lots of you know uh, even a better insight um, on the subject and uh, uh, you know krati really you were wonderful so everybody did a good job and uh, you know now i think you know we we are so ready with this uh, panel discussion on IHCP anywhere everywhere you know so i was asked to um, arrange a panel in the RCOG coming RCOG national conference, I, and I said IHCP. I and now, you know, we are doing here. <laughs> so thank you very much for involving me. It was a wonderful, wonderful panel. So one, one just a little thing about genetic testing, uh, Seema. I think it has also got a lot of bearing on the on the blood relations. So you know, once we do it, so at least you know, can warn all the blood relations of the patient, so that you know they can also be wary of the condition right because it has oh. got so many dreadful really? long term so we are not routinely doing that i will only get after stillbirth the reference so I, said, I said if we know the genetic uh, yeah. genetic yeah, but this uh, is, uh, of the know. Patient. yeah all right thank you over to achala now <laughs> or back to jyotsna yeah thank you yeah i would like dr achala to give her comments I think uh, the panel was really good and uh, we uh, I was seeing the chat box, the questions were coming 
and by the end of the panel you know there's nothing left to ask you know most almost all the questions yeah. have been answered except one or two we'll just highlight and uh, i think uh, uh, the at the end learning about all the guidelines we have learned you know like how variable is, are the guidelines and it again reemphasizes the need for our own guidelines and that paper uh, in which this newton score is there i think that should form a you know beginning point for what we have to do for isc especially uh, now we know that uh, we may not have to take the cut off as uh, 10 or 15 because even without uh, that also the levels are as i as 28 so there is a lot of need for a lot of work so that we can decrease even when we start doing dialysis if our baseline level are higher then we will probably be doing less terminations at 37 weeks with the dialysis level so i think very good take home uh, messages we have got i think uh, most of the questions have been taken there one or two which uh, i thought ki just for uh, like somebody has said why do postprandial i think it was answered very well but uh, their uh, issue was that if we do postprandial we'll diagnose more though i think angela was very, very clear that postprandial will diagnose more and uh, it doesn't matter if we diagnose more we are not terminating by diagnosing more we are just being vigilant by diagnosing more you know the termination is not diagnosing i it does not mean we are terminating early we are just diagnosing and being vigilant and you know ihcp it's like an epidemic now like diabetes yeah i think we were diagnosing another question was why it is an epidemic i think we are diagnosing more we are making people more aware and i don't think there is any reason it should be more anybody has any idea why it is more for me it is probably we are diagnosing more Hey, IVF pregnancy and lot of usage of progesterone, progesterone and that too, progesterone. not one, three, three, four, four together. You know, maybe contribute. Uh, there was a IVF request. IVF. There was a request that Dr. Kaval Gujral to comment upon the role of progesterone in causing increase in the IHCP. Specifically, the request came. Yes, you see, clinically in practice, definitely progesterones. and i have seen it higher with intramuscular septin hydrolysis the proliton depo and all this is clinically experience but when i look at the literature the largest trial said it otherwise they did not find increase with septin hydroxy the intramuscular progesterone and they found it more with vaginal progesterone this is the largest progesterone trial so i don't know where to stand and where to comment according to me in my practice vaginal progesterone does not but the oral progesterone that sustained release tablet oral sr which is available uh, they are taking that causes the first one causes i shouldn't take the trade name and the uh, 17 hydroxy progesterone it does cause the moment you stop like uh, earlier in pregnancy when you get such high levels and you always find it's a progesterone you take it off the levels become low yeah so Yeah, absolutely. The, I love all the progesterones. Yeah, yeah. Oral progesterone. I have just told you. We can go on and on. It's such an absorbing yeah. subject. Yeah. But uh, now I would uh, want Dr. Neela Magarwal, who is uh, the you know founder president of this uh, Silver Society, to give her final remarks about this panel and what she wants to say. Dr. Neela, a very good initiative you've taken to start this society. Over yeah. to you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Atla. first of all my congratulations to your committee committee for study of stillbirths in ihcp and congratulate i congratulate you dr amrita dr jyotsna and all other eminent faculty who were there and the points have been made crystal clear i would say and i should not be again repeating all the points there have been very clear uh, carry home messages and most of the controversies have been discussed as well as resolved so i'll just be giving one or two messages first is first was about the diagnosis uh, being uh, comment about being epidemic it is not epidemic because we are more aware and use of progesterone is the another uh, thing because if you see any prescription most of the prescriptions a woman is taking especially after the ivf pregnancies she is taking progesterone by each and every possible route intramuscular also oral also and vaginal also 
so that might be one cause of increased uh, diagnosis and other is definitely increased awareness so as obstetricians especially taking care for prevention of stillbirths we should be sensitized to keep obstetrical cholestasis in mind and since women may not be coming forward on their own about the history of itching we should be objectively asking about itching to each and every woman after especially after 30 weeks because these uh, stillbirths are definitely preventable as ihcp may cause sudden iufd and we may just diagnose it after the diagnosis of uh, ivf so we must be sensitized for this especially in the peripheral uh, at the peripheral levels we must create uh, awareness as well as sensitization of gps as well as the obstetricians about the ihcp second thing is that UD, uh, udca should be started only after uh, confirming that after making the diagnosis for example itching is required by all the societies so itching with either increased bile acids and uh, increased ilft or at least one of the two must be increased along with itching for starting uh, udca and i would just like to uh, share with this uh, pan, uh, with this gathering that uh, a multi centric uh, pan india trial is being started uh, by abbott uh, soon on safety and uh, efficacy of udilev in ihcp by picture study phase 3 trial and uh, L, uh, lady Har from lady harding dr saxena is leading that trial and uh, pgi is one of the centers there are five centers from the north three from the east two from the south and two from the west so there are 12 centers and in one year they will complete the data about safety and efficacy of uh, udilev and then we will have the clear picture and the third thing is dr achila's uh, suggestion is very very relevant that we should have our own data we all are from uh, we have so many that, academic uh, uh, institutes in our uh, uh, society as members so we can always plan a multi centric trial dr achila can take the lead and multi centric trial and you can uh, include many academic uh, uh, institutes dr achila we are all uh, we are all supportive and we should have our own data as we have seen so many guidelines are there and in fact we can have our own data and we can have our own guidelines also yeah thank you thank you very much uh, dr neelam for the wise words and uh, i think now we are at the end of our uh, hi dr neelam hello yeah achila yeah, uh, dr you. asha mishra has raised her hand does she want to say something dr asha mishra or it is by mistake oh no it's not by mistake it was <laughs> one of i raised the question for uh, progesterone use of hydroxy progesterone huh? sometimes it is required and it i have found that it was told that the uh, uh, cholestasis was just because of the progesterone so we should be careful while using progesterone during pregnancy that was my concern and i think for contraception in these patient uh, this pop pill should be taken or should be not be given later on if they have a persistent history of cholestasis intrahepatic cholestasis during pregnancy should we uh, had progesterone as contraceptive we can give uh, we can give yeah no we we can give them there is no absolute contraindication but it is a category 2 means that you have to give it cautiously we have to monitor the patient if you give so we uh, one thing is that after 6 weeks we should always do the lft and see the bile acids that they have come back to normal and in uh, if they have come back to normal we can prescribe it to them but we should keep a monitoring uh, on you know at least initially that how they are responding to it but it is not contraindicated per se thank you thank you so much uh, now at the end of this very uh, informative and illuminating uh, panel discussion with so many learning points for me and i'm sure for everyone else now i would uh, like to invite dr nitika garg uh, she is the treasurer of the stillbirth society of india for vote of thanks organizing faculty and august audience present here it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of those who really worked hard 
to make this event possible. I express my sincere gratitude for our chair, Dr. and Amrita Dasya, for such an inspiring and thought-provoking overview of the topic. We are enriched by your precious pearls of wisdom, ma'am. We have our honor to have our president, Professor Neela Magarwal, over here. Your thoughts touching the no words to appreciate Dr. Harsha, who, whose deep and intellectual way of imparting facts has added glory to this event. Thank you so much, ma'am. The panel discussion kept us talking experts, Dr. Ranjina, Dr. Achila, ma'am, moderator, Dr. Josna Suri, ma'am, and panelists, Dr. Gujral, ma'am, Dr. Anjila, Dr. Anjali, Dr. Seema Thakur, ma'am, Dr. Kati, and Dr. Sumitra. They gave it was deep insight into the topic and revealed few practical and useful facts that made so many things crystal clear. Thank you, ma'am, for each one of you. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a very, very diligent and dedicated secretary, Dr. Tamkeen Khan, ma'am, and our joint secretaries, Dr. Asna Ashraf, ma'am, and Dr. Aisha Ahmad. Heartiest congratulations for conducting such a useful webinar, ma'am. Finally, a big, big thanks to the audience who participated so enthusiastically taking the dialogue forward. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the wonderful evening. Thank you.